It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. Dr. Masood Amen is an IEEE and ASME fellow. Currently, he is Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Minnesota. He is widely credited as being the father of the smart grid and a cyber physical security leader who directed all security-related R&D for North American utilities after the 9-11 tragedies. Masood is the author of more than 340 different peer-reviewed publications, the editor of seven collections of manuscripts, and served on the editorial boards of six academic journals. Please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Masood Amin. We are now going to assign presenter rights to Masood. Good morning, and many thanks, Wayne, for your leadership. I'm truly honored uh, to be here for the first webinar that Omicron has offered. Uh, and my hat is off to all of you at Omicron and the colleagues who have called in our distinguished presenters today from across many parts of the industry, as well as the organizations that um, are involved and are going to view it online during this um, times of fear and uncertainty, uh, only way that we can survive it is to come together and be able to do meaningful, meaningful work together. If you look at the history, Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, and also Tesla did some of their best work when during challenging times, during the 1665 pandemic, that, that's when Isaac Newton discovered the laws of gravity an apple didn't fall on his head, but he did uh, discover gravity, did pioneering work in optical sciences, and also uh, created a large foundational part of calculus. The same with Tesla. So thank you for your leadership. This is the time for us, our industry, and the greater good of the communities we serve to keep the lights on. So without further ado, I'm truly honored to share with you for the next 15 hours, oh, I meant 20 minutes, but <laughs> a summary of uh, the, the area and kick off the kind of opening act for a terrific group of presenters that are, we are going to hear from. First of all, we all know that we are in the midst of a transition. It's a gradual one and depends what part of the world you live in and a complex set of partnerships, industry, government, regulation, local regulation, and what available fuels you have. But we're moving from fossil fuels, long distance central stations, aging infrastructure, and being close to the, in many parts, constrained during peak times, other times only at 50% usage of the assets to distributed power uh, to renewables and other areas, smarter grid and zero energy buildings. If you look at it worldwide, and I'm pleased to have shared this before for some of the colleagues who may have seen it, as well as I'm grateful to my colleagues at IEEE, including Mr. Wayne Bishop and Dr. Damir Novosel and so many others who have helped create a large parts of this presentation over the last two, three years. So when you look at the actual unsubsidized use uh, location, and availability, and availability also to transfer it from where you have it, where the loads are, to where the sources or distributed sources are, combined with also reduction locally, efficiency, and others. Look at the prices that are unsubsidized or low. The challenge then is how do you harvest that and how do you bring it to customers, to population centers. Another important part out of Bloomberg is how the price is declining, continuing to decline, and uh, price of both wind, onshore wind, as well as um, solar PV module costs. How much are learning curve also to run them better, to run them more efficiently, and to integrate them much better have increased over the last three decades, or even longer, four decades. I wanted to share with you an example. I have the privilege of being a keynote speaker at a large intellect conference that largest IEEE and uh, manufacturing uh, consortium of all the manufacturers, non-profit organization in India a couple of years ago. 
And this example is from Gujarat. Those of you who are familiar with India, Gujaratis are very entrepreneurial. They look for opportunities to really uh, harvest and make money out of it in any area that business opportunity, technology opportunity, trade is. So Gujarat Power had a wind capacity. You're seeing the data on the page. I'm not going to go through each one, but they went through renewable energy. And as you know, coal is king in India. And that also, if you have traveled there, you have spent time there, you see, you have seen it. So going from the policy that the Gujarat state, one of the 29 states in India had for encouraging participation in a green initiative, move them the first two years before they did this, as they were investing in that greener infrastructure, integrating the parts that you saw in the last page, the putting the solar capacity, putting rooftop uh, and, and solar rooftop in various areas, population centers. By doing that, this is the red parts are the money that was invested. And then after that, they're making money. Depending on the year, depending on the load, depending on weather conditions, they're actually making money every year. So that central type of control and creating uh, opportunities for improvement turned it into a win-win win-win situation, even in terms of power outages, it reduced the number of power outages and power disruptions. So related to that, to give you an example from far away and an example here in beautiful Minneapolis um, in the North Star State, these are some of the projects that my team and I have here at the University of Minnesota. And I'm grateful some of these I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna identify the terrific uh, colleagues who were my grad students who did the work, but from storage and renewable integration in microgrids to apply projects to actually build it in a campus, whether it's an industrial, commercial, residential um, com community, or whether it's a campus of a, one of the five campuses of the University of Minnesota, all the way to smart cities, smart buildings, analytics, and also for the Department of Defense and some other agencies autonomous grid connected microgrids. So I'm not gonna to talk too much through that, but I put storage and renewables twice because we did it not only for these, I should have probably integrated that uh, together with the autonomous grid connected, as well as smart grid university. That's a huge hundred million dollars a year is our electricity cost in the University of Minnesota system. And then Minnesota Smart Grid Coalition and and if you are not a member of IEEE Smart Grid, I highly recommend it, it's complimentary. You get access to amazing work. Several of our presenters today have, have published amazing work in there and have given webinars. So I highly encourage that. So with that, I share with you the work that I had the privilege of doing with Mr. Jesse Gantz, who is now in Seattle, he did his Masters, almost the PhD, his, his master's thesis, Professor Bruce Wallenberg and I, we worked closely together before he retired. And we told him, Jesse, this is a doctoral dissertation, it's not a master's thesis, but he had family reasons that he wanted to move. He's amazing. If you ever come across Jesse Gantz, some of the results I'm going to share, or Dr. Anthony Giacomoni at the PJM, uh, and many other amazing people I've had the privilege of working uh, with my uh, team as my graduate students. So we, we assessed all kinds of different storage technologies in combination with traditional sources of power as well as renewables, and we mapped them into capabilities. So higher value for storage is the top part is the vertical axis that you're seeing. It's the type of the benefits. This is thanks to my colleagues at EPRI my former colleagues at EPRI. And then as you look at capacity discharge value for reliability for operations and uh, right through capability, technologies and size of the application is on the bottom part of that vertical axis. As you move forward and you optimize these, uh, it becomes a nonlinear stochastic optimization problem, multi-objective, and it has all kinds of 
uh, mixed integer and real time uh, uh, integer and continuous variables in it. So you have to do both optimization and simulation and keep optimizing the location and mix and placement, type and placement of storage devices in addition to where you're going to be able to put your renewables. So going back to the example of Morocco and Mexico and southeastern, southwestern part of the United States, its ability to store it, use it locally, as well as transmission to bring it or distribution system into other neighboring microgrids. So we assessed a bunch of different applications. Here you are seeing the top five. And then the requirements, these actually have number ranges to it. Here I'm showing you as qualitatively medium, low, high, as well as what it does. As we go forward, this was the optimization problem, which was, pardon me, <coughs> I do not have coronavirus, but I do have an allergy and things are beginning to bloom in beautiful North Star State. We looked at the maturity of the technology, and this was in collaboration earlier with every uh, capacity, power in kilowatts, efficiency, life cycle, and cost. And the technologies that you're seeing, storage technologies, you're seeing it there. Uh, over time, we updated that, but here I'm showing you the early part, how you started. And then, we applied it to one of the five campuses of the University of Minnesota in Morris, that Otter Tail Power Company, an amazing also utility, uh, works very closely with the university and provides power. We have two wind turbines there, and each one of them has a one and a half megawatt peak, and wind is about 1.65 megawatt, uh, megawatt wind, wind, tur uh, wind turbines. And the mission of that particular campus is to be sustainable. About 20 to 23 buildings, so it's almost like an industrial, educational, or if you would, commercial, residential, with lots of labs in there. But sustainability is part of the existence mission of University of Minnesota Morris. So we, we had the low profile in red, we had the wind in green, Autotel power transfer to University of Minnesota uh, is in lighter, like a bluish color. And then we have the dark blue, which is the wind output. So taking that and applying it to the optimization and having a model of the system uh, and battery storage, mix and optimization of that. And we only have cost, in this, in this case, commercial and industrial customers. And uh, this is, uh, we wanted to also reduce net demand due to priority right through. So when we assessed it for the customer outage costs, the numbers you are seeing on the right hand bottom of the screen are what we have, uh, quantification of that. And those costs are very conservative. In reality, they were probably 20 to 25 percent higher than that. But we wanted to be conservative. So as we applied it, we could show with the judicious selection of storage device combined with the wind turbines, we could really increase the voltage support. We could have a more re reliable system with a lot more stability and ability to absorb shocks through the system with the, with the technologies that I briefly shared with you. So we split it into five microgrids. And those are depending exactly where the uh, connectors are, where the closers are, and uh, talking about reclosers and so on. That's exactly what the application is. And the reliability analysis for the feeders into that. So it became five microgrids within the, this campus. And then we applied the location, what battery energy storage that we uh, selected based on the, that messy big optimization problem and tons of simulations. And the location of it, where to place it, M4 has a very high reliability requirement. There's a lot of cluster of uh, laboratory parts in it, which is this cluster on the right-hand side that you see. As we applied that, we could quantify everything, capital cost, added savings, based on smoother operation, more power reliability, less outages, 
and not buying power from authoritarian power, actually selling power with them. That work, uh, Dr. Anthony Giacomoni, who is now at the PJM, he did an additional work as part of his postdoc with me in that area. And look at the cost recovery. Have you ever seen cost recovery in the order of under a year and a half? It's amazing. If you do it judiciously, depending on the location, and then look at the bottom part, bottom one third of the screen, you can improve the reliability, SADI, SAFI, KD. KD remains the same, doesn't change much. But you can improve relatively substantially SADI and SAFI and recover the cost within under a year and a half for each one of them. And especially number of customers served, whether it was a classroom, which is mostly M1 and M2 uh, and M5 or other locations. What I'm not showing you is the wind uh, turbine locations that are in M5 actually in that cluster. So lessons learned from this microgrid together with optimization, together with standards that's gonna come up, Dr. Bobak, uh, my colleague, Dr. Bobak and IIT is going to present that, that's, that IEEE standard. So connecting it in a seamless way, we learn, consider all parts together. So holistic systems approach, everything. And I'm going to go through some of them in, in the concluding slide. Focus on benefit to cost payback. Otherwise, how do you justify in a small campus of a state university that about 70 only about 16% of our revenues come from the state. The rest of it are generated from tuition and research and development funding we attract. Remove foundational deficiencies. Already you can say uh, low hanging fruit 20 to 30% by having a, an efficiency police. Your, your students going around and looking for those your problem areas. Engage them and use the university as a living laboratory. So this becomes part of course projects. My other colleagues also, uh, you have seen that throughout the, uh, within North America and across the world have done similar approaches for many decades. So lessons learned is customer is at the center of the nested Russian dolls, these layers of infrastructure that we built, and it has to have successful policy. That policy may be state, may be that locality may be the mission of that particular organization, in this case, one university, and then enable every building and every node to become an efficient, secure, and smart energy node that can not only participate, but can also learn to negotiate. And we get into that in the remaining four slides. Part of that is making this building smarter. Building automation is huge. And in this case, we have Honeywell, we have Johnson Controls, and all the, all the other colleagues that have helped in this area. And then some of them are internet connected, that poses a problem. So how to connect to the internet and that data that you're communicating is the minimal data you need, and that one is secure and is made secure. I'm not gonna go into details, that's another presentation. But you also collect ambient intelligence. So this evolution is what we have gone through. And uh, going to cyber physical system in, in the age of internet of things, and this journey really began in the 1990s with the, with the Marriott building in downtown New York City that our hearts hurt for New York, New York and New York City right now. I hope that you are safe. But uh, making that uh, one hotel more efficient, having its own generators, and having its own backup. So as we press forward in this area, to conclude my presentation, we have seen these microgrids play a growing role in meeting local demand. And then industry and consumers work together is successful. Otherwise, when other interests get in there and create a wedge between consumers and uh, the customers in some location they're called, and the utility, local utility, it becomes contentious, as we saw in San Diego, in Hawaii, and elsewhere. So important thing is to create a partnership early on, as we did in, in this little state called Minnesota. And goals of it were clear. We're ensuring also job creation. You would, you would imagine how many jobs this would create. And uh, in this case, it's about 42 jobs were created in a matter of three years. 
there was no stimulus money. It was all local. And we did it on our own, basically. Uh, it was a proposal we had to the DOE, but they selected major uh, Boeing and others to actually do the project. We weren't funded. Uh, so possible transition and hybridization to go to this big centralized scenario of where we have been to hybrid system and then local microgrids that is used for some of the Department of Defense over 3,000 facilities that they have, not to depend as much on the for critical functions on the local utility. There are quite a bit involved in there. And there's a lot of risk management, return on investment, objectives you have, disruptions that you may experience. And then as you look at this, these scenarios and what are transition, another part that we did is the is the vulnerability assessment, vulnerability mapping. I'm just gonna share one slide with you. So we developed scenarios. We picked the brain, the brains of the industry, various agencies, and these are some that I'm uh, uh, I'm have the permission to share in public. These were some of the things we had: disruptions in the Middle East, green movement, non-renewable energy abundance, policies that so we end up with the vulnerability mapping and the critical ones, the top three, the top four, are the ones that we go for. And that's evolved, so we update this dynamically, data-driven. If you're interested more, there's quite a bit that my other colleagues and I, we have written on that. One of them, for example, moving away from central power that shares with you a lot of lessons learned on the journey in that area. Then how to save aging assets, how to connect your existing system that you're not throwing away the marvel of engineering. The challenges in doing that, and there are some of the key considerations, are availability of reliable technology that is secure, its standards that you're going to hear about, cost benefit, policy, either it's your policy, your own organization, culture change is part of that, or it's the state or, or the region that you work in, business continuity, training, and not resilience is huge. So audits cyber, physical security, and others are a huge part of it. However, it requires a culture change and human factors to bring that in. How many of you have an idea that has been shut down by others saying that we tried that 10 years ago and it didn't work? Well, technology was unavailable. So as the father of modern management science says uh, that, that everything requires leadership because naturally three things happen in every organization. Friction, underperformance, and confusion. So I look forward to your leadership in making this transition possible and hearing from our distinguished colleagues. Thank you from Goldie the Gopher in beautiful Minnesota. Thank you, Masood, for that very insightful presentation. Very, very much appreciated. Don't forget, everyone, to post your questions using the Q&A button. We will now pass the microphone to Eugenio, who will field questions from the audience. Eugenio? Thank you, Wayne. And thank you, Masood, for the great presentation. Thank you. Um, so I want to start with one question here. So how, how do you see the evolution of the electrical vehicles market and also the impact on the DER? Excellent. Relay, relay market, right? Relay market? You know, the electrical vehicle, the EV market? Oh, EV, EV, yes. That one actually it's moving rather rapidly in parts of the world that you wouldn't expect. Malmo, Sweden, as an example. Or when you look at the policies that are put in place in smaller localities to, to make that transition happen. I see that integration be accelerating when our economy picks up. As part of, um, uh, part of the change that you're seeing, every major manufacturer, auto manufacturer, has an EV, not just hybrid, but EV production or uh, uh, plant to come up. Whether it's Mercedes-Benz, BMW, the big three in Detroit. And we have worked quite a bit as part of IEEE and my old job at EPRI to bring manufacturers, especially auto manufacturers and other sectors in. So I see that actually as a key enabler for 
a much more secure future, less pollution, less emissions, job creation, and actually when you think about it, mobility, now uh, with the slowdown we have had, we have learned that we may actually need less transportation of the sort we have, and we can do that transportation more effectively. With the, with the oil war between Saudi Arabia and Russia, we are having oil, you won't believe it, at 100, uh, sorry, $1.09 cents per gallon in Winona, Minnesota. I mean, we are having crisis. I haven't seen since I moved to America back in 1970s. So I see that coming, but it's going to be also a function of price of oil, very much locality policy, in the, because uh, having absence of national policy slows down that part. So if there is a national policy, it has to be done in close partnership with all the stakeholders. So it cannot be done a command and control. Bring them in, and that's a great area to actually put a dent in electrification of transportation. I hope I answered your question. Okay, thank you, Mr. Then one more question before we move to the next one, to the next presentation. So in which energy storage technology do you see the most exciting advancements? You know, I think it's beyond lithium ion. Lithium ion is amazing, thanks to Dr. Goodenough from UT Austin who invented it, and then others from Korea, from China, elsewhere have scaled it up. I think it's gonna be in salt. In <laughs> I'm gonna play a little bit with you. It's gonna be in how we store, uh, we store different, you see energy conversion also, and ability to hold the charge and not just pumped air. And if you look at some of the work NASA has done in on for onboard long uh, shuttles in space, uh, that one gives us a hint of what can come. So it's gonna be a beyond lithium ion technologies that we're looking at. For the time, it depends also on the timeline. Are you thinking about two years from now, five years, 10 years, 20 years? It's gonna be a mix of things. And uh, I won't go back on my, on my presentation, but you see list of some of those uh, different chemistries that, that were used in the creation of storage devices. Don't, don't uh, lose a pump hydro. Pump hydro still is pretty good depending on what power you're using to, to push it up. So places like Bonneville Power or TVA or other localities that have a lot of hydro, you'll still be using that. But it's going to be, I think, mostly building integrated. It's going to be part of what standards do we have and what can we do locally. So there are, for example, little tiny um, devices for the room with, with their own storage built in that can actually isolate the room from the rest of the building interconnection for security and power quality reasons. Uh, so you can create mini islands within rooms or series of rooms, depending on how secure you want to be within that locality. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. 